fellow students, and welcome back to another lecture for sexualities and social issues. Today, we're going to cover the basics. So we're going to go all the way back and talk about what sociology is, what sexuality is, what gender is, and then ultimately tie them all up together in a neat little bundle. So in case you've never studied any sociology before, we're going to go all the way back to the founding of sociology, and I'll tell you about some of our most important theories and our most important theorists and the way that we tend to see the world. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the literal definition of sociology, because that's always a good place to start. So this definition comes from the American Sociological Association, which is our like primary professional organization. Sociology is the study of social life, social change, and the social causes and consequences of human behavior. So as you can tell, this is a really big definition. It already includes lots of things. It already includes causes and effects. It's a lot. They go on to talk about how sociology studies the structures, and that's really important to us. Big picture social structures. Sociologists investigate the structure of groups, organizations, and societies, and how people interact within these contexts. So one way to think about it is that psychology is kind of the study of one person. What's going on with that person? Sociology is kind of the study of society. What's going on with all these people? And of course, in psychology, we talk about social institutions, and in sociology, we talk about individuals. But kind of the best way to think about it is that sociology is a study of society, like what's going on outside of you in your head, what kinds of things are impacting you. So if you ever get lost, the main three things that we always talk about are race, class, and gender. So if we're ever trying to think about, is this sociological, or how might a sociologist think about this, it's always important to think about whether the thing itself is impacted by race, class, or gender, and whether that's important. So, essentially sociology, the study of society. The next thing I want to tell you about is what we call the sociological perspective. And this is kind of a way of thinking about the whole world with a sociological mindset. So the really famous version of how we talk about it comes from Peter Berger, uh, who's a famous sociologist from the 50s. And he said, it's seeing the general in the particular. So this is kind of a weird phrase, but what it really means is that you are looking at a very specific instance. Like say, for instance, you are looking at these ads from a clothing company. And you might think to yourself, this is a very normal way to sell clothing. This is what women look like in clothing. This is what men look like in clothing. But you might also think to yourself, hey, these ads are weird. Why is the woman who is advertising the shirt taking the shirt off? Why is the woman who is advertising the bathing suit bending over so far when the men who are advertising their bathing suits are just standing there? So it's kind of like when you see something and you think to yourself, hey, that's weird. Sociology allows you to back up and think about why it might be weird. Do we sell all women's clothes this way? Do we sell all men's clothes this way? And that sort of thing. So the sociological perspective essentially allows us to look at one unique instance and think to ourselves, hey, does that happen other times? Is that influenced by anything in particular? So for instance, these pictures are influenced by gender. The next thing I want to talk about is what's called the sociological imagination, which is a little bit more exciting way to phrase it. So the sociological imagination is basically thinking about things in the big picture which can be really hard to do. We are all living our own unique lives with our own unique stories, and sometimes it's hard for us to think about all of the big things that impact what we do all day and the decisions that we make. So the sociological imagination is about thinking about the world from a very specific way. C. Wright Mills, again, one of our founding sociologists, and he said, the awareness of the relationship between personal experience and wider society. So sometimes the things that we think are just us, just our personal experience, are actually hugely influenced by the wider society and what we were told was normal and what other people are doing and what we think other people are doing. So for instance, the third date rule. Is it real? No, we made it up. But what it means is that your personal experience, your third date with another person, is heavily influenced by what you think other people do on the third date. Here's you and this person you've hung out twice before. Are you expected to have sex on the third date? Maybe. But it's very dependent on what you believe is normal and what the other person believes is normal and what everybody around you believes is normal. So the sociological imagination is more about 
placing your experience in your broader society. In previous generations, it has not been normal to have sex on the third date. In other countries, it is not normal to have sex on the third date. But in America, we have just sort of agreed that this personal experience is normalized by the wider society. So the sociological imagination has a lot to do with putting yourself in the big picture, which can be hard to do. The next thing I want to talk about is the Thomas theorem. So this is named for the Thomases who invented it, but basically this is what it says. If men, or people, define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. So sometimes in society we get obsessed with something that is not real, or not important, or not tangible, but if we think it's important, it does become important. So for instance, female purity. We are very concerned with female purity. We are not concerned with male purity. Why not? We'll talk about it. But does a woman change depending on, for instance, how many people she kisses? No. Is a woman different if she has had sex with two people versus three people? No. But we think that she might be. And so we act like it's super, super important. So even though purity is a difficult thing to define and it's very vague and it changes depending on what year it is and what country you're in, we're very concerned with it. It's imaginary and nobody knows what it means, but we're very concerned with it. And that's crucial to sociology. We do this all of the time. Like race, for instance, we don't even know what race is precisely. Biologically, it's not important. Socially, it's very important. We're very concerned with it. So the Thomas theorem is basically about the things that we decide are important. We are suddenly very concerned with this thing. Were we concerned with it yesterday? Who cares? It's important now. So it helps to explain why sometimes as a society we become fixated on something and we act like it's super, super important, even though from the outside perspective, from outside of that society, it might not mean anything at all. So the Thomas theorem can be really useful for sexuality because all of the time we just decide that something is important, whether or not it really is. Okay, the next one is about the social construction of reality. So you can see how the other theories were kind of leading here. So the social construction of reality is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically this idea that we have just all agreed that certain things are real and certain things should happen, even though, again, we're just making this up. So this one was basically invented by Berger and Luckman, who you heard of before, but here's what they said. Habitualization, a word they made up, any action that is repeated frequently becomes cast into a pattern which can then be performed again in the future in the same manner and with the same economical effort. So essentially, once we decide that something is normal, we decided that you go to college for four years. Why? I don't know. Almost nobody does it in four years. Or like we decided that the correct order to do things is love, marriage, baby carriage. Why? I don't know. Nobody does that either. <laughs> But basically, we construct this reality for ourselves where we say that something is just important or it's real. And once we happen enough times, once we see it happening enough times, we're convinced that it is real. So we basically together just construct a reality. We decided that everybody gets married and it's a ceremony and it's a church and there's a white dress and there's a diamond. Is any of that necessary? No. But that's our social construction of reality. It's very important to us. So in sociology, this is one of the things we talk about a lot. Like what we think is normal is basically an agreed upon uh, social construction. Okay, so the next thing is the self-fulfilling prophecy. So basically, you probably heard of this one, but what it means is that sometimes if we decide that something is true, we sort of act like it's true, like the Thomas theorem from earlier, and that creates a recurring reality. So this is the way it was defined by Merton. Self-fulfilling prophecy is a false definition of the situation evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception true. So sometimes we can say that something is true often enough to sort of allow it to be true. So when we say, for instance, boys will be boys, what we're really saying is we allow certain behavior from boys that we do not allow from girls. And what that means is that we do begin to allow that behavior. We allow boys to break the rules. As they grow up, we allow them to break the laws. When boys pull girls' pigtails, we act like boys will be boys. When boys rape girls at parties, we act like boys will be boys. So essentially, if we set this behavior in place, 
boys can't control themselves and, you know, girls can, then we act like it's true and it becomes a thing that we just sort of enact in our daily lives. We enact it in our laws, we enact it in our policies. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. This one can be hard because you have to back all the way up out of your reality to be able to look at a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it can become super important. Again, especially in regard to how we think about sex and how we think people who are sexual should behave. Okay, the next one is impression management. And this one will come up over and over as we talk about sexuality, especially as we talk about who we decide to date and who's worth marrying and how we act on dates. Because impression management is about shaping your behavior so that people see what you want them to see. So this one comes from Irving Goffman, another one of our famous sociologists. And he said that basically we present ourselves as we wish to be perceived. So no matter who we are or who we believe we are on the inside, we might act a specific way so that other people believe something about us. So he said that it was kind of like drama, kind of like putting on a play. He called it dramaturgy. And he talked about thinking of social interactions as a scene in which you play a part. So you might go into a situation thinking to yourself, I'm gonna play the part of like self-confident sexy person. And sometimes you can fake it till you make it, right? Or sometimes you might put out that impression and people believe you even if you don't believe you. Or sometimes we think somebody wants to see something specific. We try to look sexy by putting one finger in our mouths, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes we look like the dog, right? So impression management can work and it can also fail. But the important thing about it is to remember that often in social situations, we are performing. We are doing what we think is expected of us. We are acting in a way that sort of portrays us as a specific kind of character. And sometimes it's not intentional, but sometimes it is intentional and it's very important for our, again, shared construction of reality that we understand what roles everybody is supposed to play and what role we are supposed to play. Okay, last one, the looking glass self. So this one is also closely related to what we've been talking about. This one is also about sort of acting a part, but this one does get more personal because this one is also about believing in what your role in society might be. So there's three parts of the looking glass self. The first is imagining how you look to other people. And this can be really hard because body dysmorphia, for instance, is very real. Very often you will look in the mirror and you will see something looking back at you that is much skinnier or much fatter or much more muscled or much less muscled than what you thought. So imagining how we look to other people can be super tricky. The next part is imagining that those people are judging you based on what you think they're seeing. All of us do this every time we go out in public, unless you have a great healthy self-image in which case, but imagining what other people are thinking when they look at you is a crucial part of this. Because in part, that means that you understand the norms. You understand what you're supposed to be looking like and what you're supposed to be behaving like. And you understand what those people might be expecting out of you. The third part is viewing yourself based on those judgments. So again, first you think about other people imagining you then you think about what they see when they imagine you, and then you rely on their version of you. So if people tell you all of your life that you are much too skinny to ever be sexually attractive, you will imagine yourself that way. Similarly, if they tell you you're much too fat to be sexually attractive, you will imagine yourself that way. The looking glass self has a lot to do with what we think other people want and what we think other people are seeing. So again, is it real? No, we made this up. But does it have real implications? Yes. Because if you believe, again, for instance, that other people find your body unacceptable, you will behave as though your body is unacceptable and you will punish yourself and you will hide yourself away. So it can be real in its consequences. So hopefully those made sense. But basically what we do in sociology is we look at human behavior. And if we see something interesting, we kind of dig into it and figure out what might have started it. So sometimes I refer to sociology as like advanced people watching. If you're the kind of person who likes to, you know, sit in a restaurant or at a park and look around and think about like who these people are and what are they doing and why did they choose that outfit and who is that, their date? You might be a sociologist. Because the thing that's really important about sociology is understanding that even though your world is small and you're, you're pretty sure that you're a unique individual,
you are influenced by the bigger social picture that surrounds you. And it does have a lot to do with what you choose and what you do. So hopefully that made sense. Next, we're going to talk about some theories. Next, we're going to talk about sociological theories. So in sociology, theories aren't the same way that they would be in chemistry or something like that. We're not testing a hypothesis to find out if a thing is true. It's more like a framework, uh, like a way of thinking about the world. Some people compare it to like looking through a lens, and that lens colors the way that we see the things on the other side of the lens. So sociological theories are more like explanations of the way that society works. And sometimes more than one theory can apply to the same thing. So they're not mutually exclusive necessarily. Sometimes, you know, more than one theory can explain something that's happening, especially a really complex social issue. But often we'll find that something is best explained by one of these theories. You'll probably develop a favorite as we go. So first, let's talk about structural functionalism. So this is one of my favorites uh, because structural functionalism is very logical. It's sort of like thinking of society as a machine, and each piece of society has its own part that it plays, and it has to play that part because that's how the machine works. So if you think about different parts of society operating so that society itself can function, that might sort of help. So structural functionalism basically says that society is organized into parts, and each part has their job, has their function. And if each part does its function, society will itself work really well. So one example, again, in regard to sexuality, would be thinking about dating as a structural functional system in which men have a role and women have a role. And typically we think of it as men being aggressive and women being passive. As men going after the date and asking out and making all the moves and women just being receptive, accepting the date, looking pretty ultimately receptive of sex. So with structural functionalism, the idea is that we both understand the role that the people are supposed to play in a date. We understand that one person is supposed to act this way and the other person is supposed to act that way and then together the thing will happen. So structural functionalism can be really useful because sometimes things do operate that way and sometimes it is nice to know what your role in society is. So think of structural functionalism as like concrete examples of society moving forward smoothly. Everything in its place, everything operating smoothly. The problem with structural functionalism is that it can be super limiting. Uh, for instance, not all men are aggressive and not all women are passive. So it isn't always correct, but it can be really comforting because it tends to see things as black and white. So it can be limiting and it can be wrong, but sometimes it is useful. The next one is conflict theory. And conflict theory is great because it's one of the simplest ones. And conflict theory essentially says some people are at the top, some people are at the bottom, and the people who are at the top are trying to hold the people who are at the bottom down. The end. <laughs> so conflict theory essentially imagines society as just a series of conflicts. There's only ever conflict. Conflict between rich and poor, conflict between black and white, conflict between men and women. And basically the argument is that almost everything that happens is a result of the people in power trying to keep the people who are not in power where they are. So you might think of conflict theory um, in terms of sexuality, again, as, for instance, heterosexuals repressing he homosexuals. Uh, or for a long time, we didn't allow interracial marriage because we thought that it, you know, unfairly combined two groups. And then for a while, we didn't allow gay marriage because we thought it unfairly combined two groups. So conflict theory can often be seen as the powerful holding down the powerless. Again, it also has weaknesses. Conflict theory simply doesn't explain everything, but it does explain some stuff. So this is a good one to have in your pocket because very often you will find that something can be explained by the conflict between the two parties. The next one is symbolic interactionism. And I love this one. This is again, very uh, key to sociology because symbolic interactionism argues that everything we do is symbolic and we're just assuming that the other people understand. And this is true you'd be shocked by how many things you have already understood today that no one told you. Humans are very fast at this. We can look at a person and in literally half a second make a whole host of assumptions about that person. Very quickly. Very quickly, not always very accurately. But we still do it. So a lot of our human interactions are symbolic. 
we understand each other's body language, we understand each other's spoken language. Um, these days we understand each other's text message language. So symbolic interaction basically argues that we're sort of like performing our roles with the expectation that the other person understands the symbols that we're giving them. So this can be super useful in terms of sexuality. So for instance, if we look at this picture, and I do wish we were live so that we could deconstruct it together, but this is a great example of symbolic interactionism. We can understand and make a story for every person in this picture. From the girl who is disappointed that her friend is ignoring her, to the girl who's clearly into the guy that she's talking to, to the guy who's physically taking up space to indicate interest. Their outfits are also very symbolic. The women, you'll notice, are bearing their shoulders and their arms. The man is fully covered down to his hat, but he does have his sleeves rolled up. The women are drinking colorful martinis. The guy is drinking a beer. Like everything about this picture is meant to tell you what's happening in this picture. And this happens all of the time socially. So I encourage you to think about this one the next time you're out in like a social situation. Kind of look around and try to figure out what people are telling you without telling you. Symbolic interaction requires a lot of knowledge of the society like that you're looking at. So that can be something that's tricky about symbolic interaction. And also, not everything is symbolic. So like all the other theories, this one does have its limitations, but it's a great way to explain the way that we are constantly giving each other signals. The next theory is exchange theory. And this one is also very simple uh, and that for that reason, very popular. But exchange theory basically says that we are just exchanging things that we both want. So this can be a really good way to explain relationships. Uh, very often when you hear somebody talk about, for instance, the trophy wife, the woman is exchanging youth and beauty for wealth and security. And that is an ages old exchange. Women have been exchanging those two things for the other two things for centuries. Millennia, maybe. So exchange theory is a good way of understanding what we are putting out and what we are getting back. So it basically says that we trade and we trade and we trade and we trade and we expect the other people to trade as well. So part of exchange theory means understanding the value that you have or the value of the thing that you want, which again, requires a certain amount of social knowledge, but it can be a really good way to explain things like trophy wives. Uh, sometimes people would even argue that like heterosexual marriage is just an exchange. So this could be a really useful theory for explaining what people are getting out of a situation. The next one is feminist theory. So feminist theory is having another resurgence, which is great, but it was basically invented in like the second wave of feminism during the 60s and 70s. And the argument behind feminist theory is that society is largely organized to be patriarchal, which means that it's largely organized for the benefit of men. So feminist theory has a lot to do with conflict theory in terms of like who has power and who does not. But with feminist theory, one of the things that they often talk about is the difference between men and women specifically. So with conflict theory, we might be talking about wealth or race or something like that. With feminist theory, we're almost exclusively talking about gender, although the other stuff does play in, of course. So with feminist theory, one of the things that they say all the time that is sort of like a catchphrase is that the personal is political and the political is personal. So for instance, if you think about birth control, that feels very personal. That's just one person controlling their birth control options, right? But it's also very political. We vote about it all the time. We legislate abortion all the time. We vote about who has to pay for health care all the time. So even though birth control feels very personal, it is also very political. But similarly, political issues can be deeply personal. So with feminist theory, the important thing to remember is that if the society is set up to benefit one gender more than the other gender, that's going to play out in a lot of ways. So the way that we treat women is fundamentally different from the way that we treat men. And what feminist theory does is it looks at why that is and what the fallout might be. Why do we earn less money? Uh, why do we see more assaults? Why do we see different crimes, etc., etc. So feminist theory basically exists to explain the way that patriarchal theories impact society. The final theory is queer theory. So queer theory is a little bit hard to explain because it is kind of broad. But the basic premise behind queer theory is that you don't have to think about things the way that they were presented to you. So with queer theory, often things are just dismissed. Uh, gender binaries are dismissed. Sexual preference binaries are dismissed. 
Uh, often you hear things referred to as turned on their head. So with queer theory, it's essentially sort of dismissing the old fashioned reality that was presented to you and coming up with something that is new and fresh and fits into the world that you're living in. So sometimes we think about it as deconstructing the world. Like why do we think that marriage has to look a certain way? Or why do we think that dating has to look a certain way? What if we deconstructed it and just did something else altogether? So queer theory is very much about sort of dismissing ideas that don't work uh, within your situation or questioning ideas that might seem old fashioned. So queer theory can be really useful for exploring things that are new or for thinking about old things in a totally new way. So again, uh, sometimes the theories can be used together. Uh, sometimes they can be used more or less interchangeably. But each of these theories is basically just like a lens through which you can look at the world and think about different kinds of social problems and social issues. So next, we're going to talk about some of our options for categorizing, because sociologists love putting things in categories. So next, we're going to talk about categorization. So I know that it's unfashionable to label things, but in sociology, we love labeling things. And sometimes putting a label on something can be very powerful. It can mean that something actually exists or that something can be legislated or that something can be studied. So in sociology, we talk a lot about labels. So today we're going to go through kind of what we label and how and what it means, because sometimes the way that we do things in sociology is a little bit different than the way it's done in other sciences or in the rest of the world. So let's start with sexuality itself. This is pretty complicated because how you identify your sexuality can be very different from what you think on the inside and what you say on the outside. It can also be hugely determined by what options are available to you. In a lot of societies, you just can't be anything other than straight. So when we talk about sexuality, generally in sociology, we're talking about two things. One is your self-identification and the other is your social identification. So your self-identification has a lot to do with who you want to have sex with. It doesn't necessarily matter who you actually have sex with, but it matters who you want to, how you identify the people that you would like to be sexually and romantically involved with. Social identification can be totally different. You might live your life one way while secretly wanting another thing. You might not, but basically your self-identification and your social identification ideally will match, but not always. It depends very much on what's going on, where and when you are. So sometimes we have a lot of categories. In this survey, you'll notice there's all sorts of categories for your personal sexual orientation. But the options you have open to you do tend to change. And there's also some question of fluidity. Can you go back and forth? Can you just go through a phase where you're one thing and then you come back out of that phase? Is it different for men and for women? So a lot of what we're going to talk about when we go through these different categories right now is what's available right now in America. But in the future, we will go back and talk about categories that existed in other cultures and in other periods of time. So let's start with what matters when we're categorizing. So again, what you believe yourself to be on the inside might not be the same thing that everybody else thinks that you are, or it might not be the same thing that you tell everyone else that you are. So one of the things that really matters in categorizing is your gender identity. So again, we have more options for gender than we have had in previous times. And we'll talk about the way that we think about the difference between gender and sexuality a little bit more in just a second. But gender identity is a huge one. It has a lot to do with what categories you fit into. We also talk about sexual preference. So again, that has to do with who you would like to interact with sexually, regardless of what's available to you. And the final part, social norms. What do you think is normal? What is available to you in your time period? So when we think about the categories, again, they change vastly depending on where and when you are. So before we get too far underway, let's talk about the difference between sex and gender. So this little uh, graph here can be quite helpful as a way of thinking about it. Gender, we often think about as certainly biological in terms of like chromosomes and organs and that sort of thing, but it also has a lot to do with your gender expression. Sexuality, similarly, sometimes we think about as biological, but again, it also has to do with your um, behavior. It has to do with who you're attracted to. So we think of gender and sexuality as two different things. Typically, in sociology, we think of sex as a more sort of like 
biological thing. And we're not generally very concerned with biological sex in sociology. Um, biological sex is one of those things that is sort of like we were talking about earlier um, in terms of it's real if we believe that it's real, right? So biological sex is real. But in sociology, it hardly ever comes up. When are we going to know about each other's chromosomes? You know what I mean? Gender is much more sociological because gender is more about what we accept socially. So typically, like I, for instance, will never need to know anything about your biological sex. It does not matter to me what you are. I might need to know about your gender because I might need to know what pronouns to use or what form of address to use. So typically in sociology, we're almost exclusively talking about gender. We're almost exclusively talking about the social aspects. So let's go through a couple of options and we'll see if that helps to clear things up. So the first option that we often see, male. Probably about 49% of the world's population is male. Uh, typically, we're going to see XY chromosomes, we're going to see external organs, we're going to see internal organs. But again, often in sociology, we talk about presentation of self. And what that means is, are you dressing and acting and moving and looking in a way that your society expects from your gender? So for instance, in America, uh, do you have short hair? Do you wear dark collars? Do you drive a truck? Do you have a beard? Like a lot of this, again, we're just sort of making up, but like what we expect to see when we look at a man is very important because you might feel obligated to present yourself that way, or you might feel obligated to not present yourself that way. But again, the social presentation, the male presentation of self is usually what we're talking about. If we see somebody on the street, do we immediately identify them as male? There's a lot of associated behaviors. We'll get into that. Similarly, you might identify as female. Probably about 51% of the world's population is female. Uh, we're a little bit more female than male in the world right now. Um, so again, we're going to see XX chromosomes, we're going to see female sex organs, including female external sex organs, which are very important to us, but also again, the female presentation of self. We're looking for long hair, we're looking for flowers on the clothes, we're looking for small cute cars, you know, like the things that we as an American society expect women to do. From here, it does get a little bit more complicated. Uh, typically in America, we do think of like, you know, two genders, but we're beginning to sort of expand beyond that. So one example is people who are born intersex. So this is way more common than we ever talk about. Probably like one in every thousand babies is born intersex. And the idea here is that biologically, there's a huge range. So the way that we were talking about certain chromosomes being typical in men versus women, sometimes with intersex people, they have three chromosomes. They might be XXY. Sometimes they have even more than that. Sometimes they have a different sort of mix depending on, you know, what stage of their life they're at. It can get super, super complicated. So basically the idea behind people who are born intersex is that they exist somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. There's a vast variation of ways that this can be. We're not sure what to think about intersex presentation of self because very often the parents or the doctors choose which gender the baby should be when they're very, very little. So the presentation of self can become a much more complicated issue later on in life when their hormones kick in or when their self-identity kicks in. So this can be very complicated. But the one thing that I want you to remember is that this is actually pretty common. We just don't talk about it. Another thing that you might have seen a lot about lately is people who identify as transgender. So interestingly, to be transgender does assume a gender binary. It assumes that you are intentionally one, like changing from one gender to another gender. Really what it means is that you feel internally, your self-identification, that you have always been one gender, but your social identification has been the other gender. So often what we see is that people take on the social identity of the gender that they believe themselves to be. So you might see people who, for instance, are biologically female, but all of their social indicators are male. You can also change biologically if you want to. You can do hormones, you can do surgeries, you can do all sorts of things. But the thing that's important about transgender is that that does assume the binary, but more importantly, it assumes that the binary is important and the gendered behavior of one gender and another gender are important and you're switching from one to the other. Some people think of it as a little bit more in the middle or they think about it as a little bit more flexible. So the sort of like umbrella term for this would just be genderqueer. So if you're genderqueer, often you don't think of gender as a binary at all. You just sort of exist somewhere in the middle. But there's a lot of options. You could sort of go back and forth fluidly. One day you're feeling more masculine, one day the next more feminine. 
or you might sort of pick and choose. Uh, you might have like really big masculine boots, but cute small feminine earrings. Like you can sort of pick and choose parts from one and the other. But the basic premise with genderqueer is that the binary is dumb and you reject it and you just exist as you see fit. So there are a lot of options for gender. Next, we're gonna talk about different ways to categorize sexuality. Much like with gender, we often think of just the two, but there's a lot of options. So the first uh, and the most common, to be fair, is heterosexuality. So this, of course, does assume the gender binary. It assumes that women and men are attracted to each other. Heterosexuality, to be fair, is very common. Uh, generally, people are assumed to be straight before given any other information. But again, if 90% of people are straight, maybe that's a fair guess. That said, we're not sure really how many people are straight and how many people are any other category because it's a very hard thing to measure and also people lie to us. The other category you're probably already familiar with is homosexuality. So again here the gender binary is assumed because it means that you are attracted to people of your same gender. How many people are homosexual? Again we don't know. Um, it might be as many as 10%, but there is the question of how often do you have to participate in a homosexual act to be considered homosexual? So this is one of the things we'll talk about today. Like if you do one gay thing, are you gay? I think not, but we'll talk about it. You might also, for instance, be bisexual. This is an increasingly common way for people to self-identify, which is really interesting because it probably means that there's something cultural going on. So if maybe like three to 8% of people identify as homosexual, we're not totally sure how many people identify as bisexual. One thing again that keeps coming up is incidence versus prevalence. Did you do you know, a gay thing one time, now you're gay? Or do you have to do a gay thing every weekend to be bi? So there's sort of this question of, did you do it one time and it counts forever? Or is this your favorite thing and you want it all the time? There's also a question of how often it occurs in terms of self-identification for women versus men. Way more women consider themselves to be bisexual than men, especially young women. It's possible that upwards of 40% of young women under the age of 25 in America consider themselves to be bisexual. So it might be incredibly common or it might be incredibly uncommon. It might exist in upwards of 40% of women and like 2% of men, again, Bisexual is really, really hard to sort of quantify and to, to figure out whether people are identifying that way today and whether they still will tomorrow. That's why perhaps pansexual has become so incredibly common. So the idea behind pansexuality is that you are sexually attracted to the person you're sexually attracted to. It doesn't matter what their gender identification is. It doesn't really matter what their sexual orientation is as long as they're into you too. So pansexuality is more about just being attracted to the person, regardless of their gender presentation, their body, their chromosomes, their organs, whatever. So it's a pretty good sort of like umbrella term for just you decide on an individual basis. And it is also becoming increasingly more common as a term of self-identification. You might be just queer. <laughs> In the olden days, we used queer as an umbrella term, and typically it just kind of means anything but cis-het. Um, so you've probably heard people talking about cis-het people lately, and what that means is cisgender and heterosexual, which means that they identify as the gender with which they were labeled when they were born, and they consider themselves heterosexual. Again, to be fair, like 90% of the population is cis-het, but a lot of people aren't. So typically, if you're just looking for like a general noun or adjective, sorry, to describe everybody else who's not that, it would be queer, but what the word queer means does change super fast. Uh, so typically it's considered an umbrella term, but you do want to be careful. It's always just best to ask people how they self-identify. There's a couple of other things that have been gaining a lot of prevalence lately. And one is people who are just asexual. They just aren't interested. So it is a sexual identity. It is a sexual orientation because the absence of the thing is still the thing, right? So to be asexual, it just means that you might have romantic feelings. Uh, you know, you might like cuddling, you might like relationships. You're just fundamentally uninterested in sex. So this is kind of an interesting category because we used to not hear of it as like a valid self descriptor. We used to think that if people were asexual, it was like a phase or because something had happened. But these days we are starting to consider it as like a lifelong sexual preference. Sort of the opposite side of that coin is that you might be aromantic. So aromantic means that you just don't particularly care about romance. 
you like sex, but you don't want to have relationships. You don't want to do the whole like human interaction part. You don't want the romance. You don't want the fuzzy feelings. You just want the sex part and then you go home. Some people, again, are aromantic for a little while. Some people are aromantic their whole lives. It's another one of those categories that's kind of recently introduced that we're starting to think about more. So again, for in terms of your sexual orientation categorization, you have a lot of options. The reason that we often talk about gender and sexual orientation together is because they do have a lot to do with one another. And again, this is going all the way back to the Thomas theorem. Are they necessarily really connected? No, but we're used to seeing them connected. We're used to gender meaning something, and we're used to people telling us what their gender identification is and their sexual identification is the first second that we look at them. So let's look at a couple of these pictures and we'll talk about what gender might have to do with sexual orientation, but specifically what gender and sexual orientation might have to do with presentation of self. So, as you can see here, um, this picture I wanted to include of the little girl kissing the little boy because very often we think about heterosexuality presenting itself really early in children. We talk a lot about children having a crush on each other and oh is that your boyfriend and oh look how cute they are. Um, and sometimes it might be a little bit weird. It might be a little bit strange to think that children have any sort of feelings in this regard, but most of the time we just assume that children are heterosexual and that they will grow up to be the same way and we act like it's kind of cute. We're also typically okay with little boys chasing little girls, so the way that we demonstrate our sexuality, even at a young age, has a lot to do with social norms. If we look at this picture in the middle, this is one of the original hosts of Queer Eye the first time around. And again, I do wish that we were in person so that we could talk about this picture and what you think is happening in this picture, even if you don't know this man. Because we have a lot of social clues. Again, this goes all the way back to this concept of presentation of self, of looking glass self. Just based on this picture, you can make a pretty accurate assessment of what this man's sexual orientation is. And that's not because he's saying necessarily anything about sex in this picture. It's because of his presentation of self. He's wearing pink, which is a traditionally feminine color, but he's wearing it in a traditionally men's wear sort of style. Um, he's got traditionally masculine hair, but he's clearly made a little bit of effort with his skin and maybe a little bit of makeup. And then of course there's his posture. So while none of that has anything to do with who he might want to have sex with, we all understand it as a symbol to us of who he wants to have sex with. So that's what I mean when I talk about presentation of self. Even though, you know, we've never met this man and we can't hear him or look at him in person or anything like that, we still know what he wants us to know. The girl to the very far right with a shirt that says Butch, a very similar thing. Now to be fair, she is outright labeling herself, but there are interesting intersections here of what we expect women to look like and what we expect homosexuals to look like. So her very shirt tells us that we have an idea of what women who like other women should look like and that they might fit into very specific categories. So she, for instance, is butch. Does she have a matching counterpart with a shirt that says film? I don't know. It is also not an obligation to dress like this to be butch. It is also not an obligation to be butch, but it's an understood social category. So just by wearing this particular shirt, we understand exactly what she means about who she would like to sleep with and how that might structure the rest of her life, including her marriage. Finally, at the bottom, a little more lighthearted, we have a scene from the infamous tip drill. Here we can tell that there's a lot of heterosexual language happening. Uh, first of all, the woman is fully disembodied. All we can really see is her ass, which is very nice to be fair. Um, and of course, he is disembodied, but we can still see his facial expression, so we can tell that he's enjoying it. Um, so very often in like music videos, we see this kind of thing happening, the sort of presentation of heterosexuality. And again, it isn't always accurate for that artist. A lot of closeted homosexual artists have made very heterosexual videos because they believe that's what their audience wanted, uh, or because it was illegal to be gay at the time. Or sometimes men make blatantly heterosexual videos because they want to, because that is their fantasy and the way that they would like to live their sexual identity. So in this video, he's giving us a very clear presentation of himself, that he is a straight, wealthy, sexually active man. And we are meant to understand it even from this one still. 
So again, I know it might not have made a lot of sense when I was talking about the sort of sociological theories in the beginning. The looking glass self, the presentation of self, the social like conception of what's important and what things mean, but this is how it plays out in terms of gender and sexuality and in terms of what we expect to see when we look at somebody. So hopefully these pictures help to make that make a little bit more sense. So the final thing that we're going to talk about today, but the thing we're going to spend much of the semester talking about, is how your society shapes your sexuality. So for most of the lecture today, we've been talking about sociological theories and sociological frameworks, options for gender, options for sexuality. But another really important thing to think about is that you exist in a very specific time and place. And there are a lot of rules that exist for you to have sex in your specific time and place. So one of the things that's worth thinking about is, of course, seeing the general in the particular. So for instance, what kind of options are even available to a person in your society? Are you allowed to date? Do your parents pick who you date? Are you allowed to get married? Who are you allowed to have sex with? All of these things are in a lot of ways shaped by your society. And first, there's the social control. Are these people going to frown at you? Are you not going to get invited to parties anymore? But then second, there's the legal control. Is what you want to do even legal for you to do? So let's start with the social control. What if you choose something that isn't popular? What if you and your partner are swingers, which people have been for millennia, but it's not something we often talk about? Or what if you and your partners are polyamorous and you have multiple loving relationships at the same time? This is perfectly legal, but it's not super common, and it might be hard to explain at Thanksgiving when you come home with three different partners. Or what if you and your partner are heterosexual and you're married, but you don't have any kids? Typically, we assume that's a normal thing for heterosexuals, so that might end up being something that you have to explain over and over every time someone asks. You might also choose something that is illegal. Some things are illegal because we believe them to be morally wrong. So for instance, in this picture, the North American Man-Boy Love Association argues that essentially pedophilia between grown men and little boys is natural and normal and should be legal. Generally, we disagree with this socially, but to be fair, we used to disagree with homosexuality. Here is a portrait of two lovers during the Victorian era who were also told that their desires were wrong and bad and against God. Or we have this couple here in the middle, the most famous interracial marriage of all, the Lovings. They had to take their case all the way to the Supreme Court to be allowed to have a legal interracial marriage because they were also told that what they were doing was wrong and illegal and bad. Typically we make these decisions based on consent, which is why I stand by my decision that pedophilia is wrong because I feel like children can't consent. But these two male lovers consented and the Lovings consented, so that's okay with me, but we'll talk about the way that we draw the lines for social rules and legal rules as we continue. Another fundamentally super interesting question about this is whether you have to tell anyone about your sexual orientation or your sexual desires or what you get up to on the weekends. We have this whole narrative these days about how important it is to come out if you're gay, but we don't expect straight people to come out. And again, to be fair, there is a lot of good that can come from coming out if you're gay or bi or pan or whatever. Because we know from studies that if you know you know a gay person, you're more likely to believe in gay rights. Or if you know you have a bisexual kid, you're more likely to be fine with bisexuality with other people. But at the same time, it's a little weird that we might be expected to tell people at work who we like to have sex with. It's kind of a weird idea. So ultimately, what we will do in this class is talk about things like this. The way that our race and class and gender shape our options. The way that we're socially expected to do certain things. If we look at these pictures, this is the question that we're going to continue to ask ourselves over the course of the semester. What is normal in your society? Do you go on dates? Does the man bring flowers? Do you go on dates but they're with other men and you don't tell anybody, keep it on the down low? Do you and your husband continue to marry other women as sister wives? Do you have a friends with benefits relationship? Do you date online? A lot of these things weren't options for your grandparents, but they're options for you. Some of these things are options for you, but they may not be options for your future grandchildren. So where and when you are has a lot to do with what your options are sexually and what you're able to be open about in terms of your sexual and your gender identification. So hopefully, this helped to explain a couple of things about sociology and what we do when we do sociology and how sociologists think about the world, 
but hopefully it especially explained a lot about sexuality and gender and the way that they can be socially controlled. We'll talk about all of this much more over the course of the semester. So if you have any questions, send me an email and I'll see you soon.